Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Reduce Downtime and Raise OEE, Overall Equipment uh, Effectiveness. My name is Don Pearson. I serve as Chief Strategy Officer with Inductive Automation Software, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to today's webinar. I think we have a very, uh, well, very interesting and important and relevant topic for you today. We're going to allow uh, plenty of time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So just as a, a simple housekeeping uh, statement, uh, there is a questions tab on your console. So you can type in questions uh, throughout the presentation, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. We'll try and get to all of them when we uh, leave time at the end for that. Just, a, uh, just as a little bit of a, well, maybe background, there's a lot of faces that I see that are, that are familiar, uh, but there's also uh, a lot of names that I see that aren't familiar for today's presentation. So a little bit of background on, uh, on inductive automation. Uh, we started in 2003 as pioneers in database-centric web-launched HMI SCADA systems, as many of you know. And it's really been uh, pretty popular and pretty successful and been applied in a, in a whole variety of different industries. Uh, you see a number of them that are covered on the screen there. But I, but I also want to say that one of the great things about the, the foundation and the, uh, uh, the architectural strategy um, as well as the licensing model and the software development timeline that we're on here has really given us the, the freedom and flexibility to develop uh, modules and, and expand into the uh, MES layer, uh, manufacturing execution systems, and uh, really bring modules that I think can add functionality that really empower you and, and your organizations, as you'll see as we go through today's presentation. And just a note here, more just because I wanted to share it with you, actually. It was just this month that inductive automation was uh, recognized by Oracle for its innovation in using Java in the industrial software industry. Uh, we received a Duke's Choice Award. I think there's 10 of them across the world that are given. And what you see here is our, uh, our lead software developers, uh, Colby Clegg in the middle and Carl Gold on the right, who went to San Francisco to accept the award and get involved and do some further training there, and Adam Messenger, who's uh, Vice President for Java SE Development at Oracle is a picture here giving the uh, award to uh, Carl and Kobe. So we're very, very pleased because it certainly is our goal to bring innovative uh, solutions in the industrial software world uh, to you. Uh, just a point on what is Ignition. It's industrial application server. It is web managed platform with web launch clients and a web launch, uh, web launch designer. As far as what can it do, I know a number of you are already familiar with this, but uh, the HMI SCADA MES functionality is strong. Historian functionality using any SQL database, business applications using any SQL database, and recipes and batch management functionality. Really, for those who are more familiar with it, can practically do about anything that you can imagine it to do. The flexibility is there, and that's partially due to um, what we put into it to make it uh, give you that functionality. Um, the licensing model is no small feature in terms of what it can do for you without your concern about additional cost to be able to do those innovations. It's sold by the server, and what that means is the following things, unlimited, free web launch clients, free concurrent web launch designers, free data points, free data connections to any SQL database, uh, free screens, free projects per uh, server, free scalability, free OPC UA server and drivers, and really it's just totally cross-platform and you know, forward, backward compatibility, Windows 32, 64-bit Linux, and OS X. So really what you're, what you're looking at if you're a manager is you want this information available, whether, it's, whether a person's a line operator or a supervisor or a manager or at the, at the executive suite level, um, the number of screens you may want to see information on, uh, the number of uh, data points you may want to, want to have on the dashboard, all of these things become not a consideration to hinder innovation when you're set up with this kind of a model that allows you to create without a concern for um, how much data or how many people you want to see at different clients to view that data. Just a comment or two on the manufacturing execution systems layer, the MES layer. It was really first used by AMR Research, now part of Gartner, and it was in 92. And manufacturing was reduced to a, a three-layer model that was focused on you know, the need to link the planning process to actual control processes on the plant floor. So you sort of had these three looks at it. The, the one layer was the planning, ERP, business systems, 
Next was your executionary MES layer, and, and then, of course, the control systems, uh, including operator interfaces uh, uh, on the facility floor. Um, and it really fits in where you see MES fits in. In the ideal scenario, you have your, your ERP systems at the enterprise level, financials, forecasting, inventory, et cetera. Then you move to the MES layer, production scheduling recipe, changeover management, OE downtime, quality, statistical process control, preventive maintenance, track and trace, auditing batch, et cetera. All these manufacturing execution layer activities. And of course, you have the plant floor. Machine control, process control, operator interfaces. And we're taking a slice of the MES layer today and going to dig in in the OE downtime world and really show how by, by looking at what's going on there and looking at what the capabilities are uh, to, to automate and gain control of that, how it can impact the, uh, the effectiveness and efficiency and profitability of your manufacturing operation. So when you think about OE, it really fits into that manufacturing execution system layer of the organization. And, and one of the things and one of the reasons we decided to do this, and I'm very pleased to, to be working with Tom Heckman today, uh, who I'm going to pass the ball to here in a second, is, is we published recently a white paper in this area, and the response to the white paper and the questions and the feedback really motivated us to take time today, dig into it more deeply, and really give you the opportunity to see more how OEE and downtime control can affect your organization in a positive way. So with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Tom Heckman and let him take a presentation from here. Tom? Thank you, Don. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to start out briefly talking about what OEE is, um, overall equipment effectiveness. But we want to get a, just the basic understanding of this um, because it's important as we go forward to kind of get the concept of this. Um, you know, it's a hierarchy of, of metrics used to measure efficiency. And, um, you know, it can be done manually with old pencil and paper and such but it's also commonly done using software. Um, in a nutshell, um, it's a set of formulas. The formulas aren't too difficult, um, but one thing that is, is more difficult is all the stuff around it. Collecting the information and getting accurate information is part of the difficulty. Integrating into your plant floor uh, can also be uh, challenging, you know, do communication networks exist and stuff, um, and into your uh, organization. How are people going to interface with it and such? It does solve the challenges of diverse products, you know, different units and different types of processes and such. Um, and I, I hear a lot of companies really alter these these formulas that are used and they, they're trying to solve some problems for their particular production environment. Um, yeah, but it really should stick to those formulas uh, if at all possible. And maybe you don't use all aspects of OEE, um, but you really should try to stick to the formulas because they, they uh, paint a true picture. And, you know, in general, OEE will tell you kind of what area is causing losses. You know, are we losing air, uh, losses in our production rate, or is it downtime? Is it uh, quality? What area is, is causing the loss? Uh, so we typically combine OEE with tracking downtime and uh, so that we can, we can zero in on the exact details of why we're getting those losses. Um, why companies don't track OE and downtime? You know, some companies are just very efficient, not really concerned about it. It's not uh, affecting their profitability too much. And if you're one of those, um, boy, you're, you're in a, a rare league. <laughs> um, sometimes you don't have time to track it. Your, your operation's busy, everybody's busy, takes time to implement it or time to, to use the system. Uh, some companies uh, don't have the budget to implement it. Other companies may not know how to move forward and actually make it uh, useful within their facility. Why companies should use it? 
you know, um, there's a number of reasons. Uh, you know, it, it, you kind of, you don't know what you don't know. So <laughs> if you don't know where your inefficiencies are, you don't know how to fix them, and you don't know how to improve it. So really, um, you can get a lot of opinions of, from various people of what they think, why they're not running well today, but getting actual facts, recorded data, it's hard, hard to uh, beat that. Um, you know, your competitors might be using it. You might be in a competitive situation which affects your profitability. And uh, so if you can lower your operating costs and increase your profits, that, that makes you stronger in, in the competitive world. Uh, and uh, you kind, kind of can think too, are, are you happy with your current efficiencies? I mean, you just kind of have a gut feel. Are you wishing your operation would, would run a little more effectively? Um, and if, if you're getting that feeling, then you really should research this out more, get more details, and start looking at ways to, to implement it. And it really just paints a clearer picture of what your production facility is doing for facilities and uh, to get to zero in and uh, at least know where you stand today, start a baseline, and then work on the improvements. The OEE calculation uh, involves three isolated factors. Uh, the first one is availability. So this is time that the line is available to run. And you know, it, it takes into account lunches and breaks and stuff like that, that you're kind of making that as time that's not available. But while you are scheduled to run, how are we doing? What things are, you know, uh, causing us to go down when we should be running? That affects the availability. Then we have performance. Performance is, is while you are running, are you running at the speed you should be? Uh, the number of units per minute, um, tons per hour, whatever whatever it might be. So if you are running at 50% speed, but you are running, that affects the, the efficiency of your line overall. And then the last one is quality. So 20% of your product that you're producing is, is bad quality. Well, that affects your overall performance. And quality actually has a... a a uh, hidden side effect too because that bad product either is potentially scrapped or it gets recycled back in or it, you have to rework the product. So you have an actual, an actual expense or time of people that's involved with quality that the other uh, isolated factors of OEE don't have. So putting all those factors together gives us our overall um, equipment effectiveness. Um, so it takes into account the planned uh, downtime. So that could be holidays, uh, so on and so forth. The unplanned you were expecting to run and, and uh, you weren't. It takes into account speed loss, quality loss, and the, the remaining is your effectiveness. In addition to OEE, there's another item called TEEP, and which is total effective equipment performance. Um, OEE is the efficiency while you are running. So if it was a holiday and you weren't running, OEE doesn't come into play. TEEP takes that into account. It looks at it over a calendar period. There's a term called loading which comes from the, uh, I think, accounting industry, actually. And that is if you, um, over 30 days, you ran your line 15 days. And assuming you're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for this example, then you would have 15% loading, 15 days out of the 30. In, during those 15 days while you were running, uh, if your OEE was 75%, then you take that 50% times the 75%, you get around 38%, and that's what your TEEP is. And this is really how well you're using that asset, that production line. 
Um, it, this can expose, uh, you know, different opportunities. Maybe you decide to run through breaks and lunches. You have a crew that covers. Um, it, it, it also exposes other things like, oh, if we run on weekends or how many shifts we run. It just, you know, helps you see those other opportunities where you can get better utilization out of your production equipment. And the bottom line is it might keep you from having to spend more money uh, capital expense-wise to put in more equipment. Downtime is the two categories. I talked a little bit about this, but we have the planned downtime. So lunches, breaks, safety meetings, holidays, uh, maybe you have some time in between changing over and shifts. These do not affect the OEE. That's where the teeth came into play. Then you have unplanned downtime. And these are when, you, when the production was shut down unexpectedly. So you expect it to be running uh, and something caused to go down. Maybe you didn't have product at the line. That's unplanned uh, because of a coordination issue. Maybe it was mechanical problems, um, operator error. There's several reasons why you can have unplanned or unexpected downtime. And it really, um, you know, coordination is a big thing, actually, because, you know, if, if the raw materials aren't at the line and the line starts up 10 minutes late, there's 10 minutes you could have been running that you're not. So, And we're going to refer to downtime here, and we're going to be talking, when we say that, we're going to be re referring to unplanned downtime. We really want to zero in on the unplanned downtime and because that has a, a big effect on OEE. So if you, if you take into account you have an eight-hour shift and you got two 15-minute breaks and a 30-minute meal, you know, that, that leaves seven hours and then you might have time for changing over your product. Uh, maybe there's time in between changing your shift. So what's left over is you really want to maximize. You want to be running as much as possible for that time that's left over. So we're going to take a look at five questions here for you to further consider. And we're going to just talk about those a little bit. And uh, we'll also show you a little bit of uh, some ways that you can kind of answer some of these questions with software. So right off the bat, you know, that you have to ask yourself, is no tracking the way you want to go? And it might be for your production facility. Is manual tracking the way you want to go? It's typically slower, um, unreliable. You have to have uh, people fill out paperwork usually on the line. Those go into somebody else. Maybe they enter into Excel or some other system. You know, maybe a week later. Three days a week later, you get information back. Um, the other thing is that's generally unreliable. So it's the uh, operators or the person marking on the sheet, yeah, they ballpark figures. Um, they may not even represent the, truly what happened because of maybe they don't understand what really happened. Or uh, they're afraid of how they're going to appear, so they don't accurately record it. So those are some of the issues with, with manual tracking. MES software, it, it is real time. You're going to get answers very quickly um, within, within a minute, basically, of how you're doing now. And at the end of your production run, you'll have the results of that production run and how it did. Um, it's also a little more accurate. It can catch downtime that's a second long. Um, so it's that. Um, you know, makes it a little more accurate data in. And I should say a lot more accurate data in. But you do have to, to integrate it within your facility. It also allows you to, with the manual tracking, um, you might get reports that are given to you and they're kind of fixed. And it's kind of hard to massage the data and look at it different ways and look for other factors that might be affecting your downtime and correlations and such where software will let you look at it just about any way you want to look at it. 
And which implant employees have the, the greatest effect on your downtime? Well, line operators do, because they're out there actually running the line. And just by giving line operators information, you know, a number of how well they're doing, they don't like seeing the number. Nobody really likes seeing the number drop. So they are a little more diligent on keeping the line running efficiently. Maybe they follow up with maintenance a little bit quicker instead of tolerating the same problem over and over again. Uh, maintenance technicians, same thing kind of applies there. Maybe they don't know because the communication hasn't occurred from the operators that there is a problem with the machine. Um, something that they can take care of. Uh, they can also monitor the number of downtime occurrences. Oh, we're starting to see more downtime occurrences. We need to do some maintenance on this machine. Production supervisors, you know, they're ultimately responsible and they have the most knowledge and they can to, uh, to resolve problems as well. So getting the right information to that production supervisor so that they can prioritize where they should be focusing their efforts, and uh, maybe where more training is needed for operators and things like that. So if you can get information back to these folks, yeah, you will see some, some improvements and such. I'm going to switch over and look at a, um, a couple of screens here that just are uh, kind of an example. You're production facility might be completely different, but this is just one example of giving information back to the operator. So some facilities, maybe this is too much information, other facilities you want a lot more. So, um, but this is just one example. So here we're seeing everything, all the information on this screen is for the current production run in the current shift. So we're seeing 2.59 here, so at 3 p.m. we're going to see a shift change. In that time, the operator needs to produce 200 or 2,000 cases. So it tells them exactly what they need to do. So then over here, they're getting a quick little graphical indication, visual indication. 2,000 cases, they produce 238. It's still green, so they're doing okay as far as their target. Their OEE for their shift here is a little bit low, and it's low because of the availability. So they're, they're experiencing a lot of downtime. But their quality and their performance, the production rate is looking good. Um, some of this information, whether it's running or down, uh, they can look at the line and see that in most cases. It also gives them a list of all the downtime events. Um, also, they can select more detailed downtime. So if they press the operator, press stop button, maybe they had a down bottle and they want to give more detail why they press the stop button. That can be useful for maintenance and supervision and, and uh, you know, if there's a team taking a look at this to resolve uh, common downtime issues, it, help, it helps give more accurate information. But all this information is very accurate to the second. <laughs> um, for supervisor, maybe line chart screens or an overview screen would be appropriate. They can see how the actual production is versus their standard rate or their target. You can show that as well. Their hourly efficiencies, waste, how that's looking, the top downtime reason. So a supervisor can kind of watch this and say, hey, there's, they're having a lot of filler problems. We have 41 occurrences of the filler going down. We need to follow up and, and uh, see what's going on with that operator. There's just a couple of examples of uh, how you can get information out to the people that can make a difference. Um, do you know how much downtime is occurring that isn't being recorded? Uh, there's small downtime events. You know, some people that talk about OEE say, well, we really only want to count a downtime event that's, that's over five minutes long or something like that. Um, I kind of recommend getting the small downtime events because I've talked to customers and um, have a couple stories here of how small downtime events added up. Um, one was a uh, major auto parts manufacturer and they were monitoring the number of occurrences for each machine. 
and they, they know the typical the, uh, number of occurrences for each machine. They were tracking that. And then they saw one machine that had a lot higher number of occurrences one day. Uh, so they went out and, and took a look at it, and an air cylinder was starting to fail. So it hasn't caused line downtime yet, but they started getting those number of occurrences showing. So they wrote up a, a, a maintenance work order to replace that air cylinder the next time the line was down and prevented downtime. So there's one case to track small downtimes of events. Um, another story I have is the uh, production line was going down. One machine on the production line was going down for maybe five seconds at a time. And then it would start back up. And it kind of caused a ripple through the line. And the operator didn't really know what was going on. He just said, oh, it went down, it started, I don't have to do anything. But this was happening many, many times over the shift. And the supervisor saw that and said, what's going on out there? Why do we have so many occurrences? Uh, just sat out there and watched it for a while and said, something's not right. Got maintenance involved, maintenance came out. And they had a, actually had a defective sensor out on the line that was causing it. They fixed that and they saw an increase of four pallets of product per shift, even though it was little five-second downtime. So when I hear stories like that, I think it's important to capture the little stuff, too. Um, the other thing is that the operators, generally it's, it's inaccurate when they're recording the downtime. And you don't really get a true picture of what is happening. So in those examples, did the operator, would they record five seconds? Probably not. Would they generalize other information? Yeah, it was about 15 minutes. And I think this was what the reason was. And it doesn't give as much detail. So not that they're not diligent and working hard, but they're running the line. It's just not their top priority. And so as a result, you don't get as accurate data. How are you currently analyzing your downtime data? Um, you know, being able to look at just different correlations, being able to look at your downtime uh, by people, by operator, or by different machines. Maybe one machine is giving you more of a problem. Maybe one operator has much more of, a, of an issue running a line. They're just not as efficient running a particular line or machine on the line even, and they need more training. Our, you able to analyze your current downtime data and get to those uh, items and then identify them so that you can make corrective action. Um, materials is another one. You have different vendors. Maybe one vendor is a little bit cheaper than another vendor, but it doesn't run as well in your facility. Do you know that? And can you make that decision that we're really saving money by going with a cheaper vendor? So it's very, very important to know these, these things. And again, I'm going to show some, some examples of uh, being able to compare and see some of these things. So here we're looking at comparison by production site. So maybe one site has a little more of a problem than another site. And um, you can focus in, in on that site. Um, instead of all your focus going across all your sites. You can be a little more targeted uh, of which site to put the, the energy into. Uh, you can take a look at individual lines and kind of get benchmarks. Uh, identify which machine has the greatest problem. You focus your efforts on that, you're going to see more return on, on that. Um, but a lot of these screens here are just kind of fixed. They're created and for, for your uh, organization, and they may not give you the flexibility. So it's real important to be able to uh, do other types of analysis and get to more 
you know, look at it in different dimensions and different ways and looking for correlations and more interactive. So this type of screen would do that for you. So here we're taking a look at downtime and we're, we're comparing it by line and we're looking at the downtime minutes here in this pie chart. You know, I want to be able to drill down and see, you know, on line one, what cells give me, we're given the biggest problem. And then even further, you know, well, we'll take a look at the filler here and we'll drill down even further and see, well, what operators are having the biggest problem? Well, Sally Johnson's having a lot of downtime with filler. So she might need more training or um, maybe she just had hit a period there where there was some downtime. But that, you at least identify that Sally Johnson is there and, and it may be an issue that you need to put your, your energies on. So very quickly, you're able to get into that and see that. With standard reports, it's a little harder to do that. Um, other things, here just in general, just seeing the operator instead of by machine, we can see, still see Sally Johnson's having trouble on the entire line, actually. Uh, we can also take a look at, here we're going to take a look at cardboard vendor and see which cardboard vendor is giving the most trouble here. So it can help us make decisions. Um, we can then export this data into other systems and put costs to it and what have you um, as well. Uh, we may want to take a look at downtime by product or OEE by product. And uh, we can drill down and then take a look at that product on the line. So based on what product we run in the plant, we maybe can determine, you know, one line's better to run that product than, uh, than another line, running that product on another line. So the bottom line here is really just having that flexibility. Uh, you want to be able to create your own uh, things that you can come back to frequently. So if I want to look at by day, I want to look at my production counts, that I can do so. Um, just whatever you can think of, being able to do that analysis and look for those correlations that are affecting your efficiencies. So the last question is, how confident are you when making decisions about increasing efficiency? So it's kind of, if you're, if you're flying in the blind and you have different people coming at you saying, this is why we're not running as well, those kind of things, um, it's hard to be confident to move forward with certainty and, and make corrective action. So the first step is, is get true and accurate information. Now, bad data coming in leads to bad actions that don't produce results. So that's the number one thing, is get the most accurate data that you can first. Then from there, you need to analyze it and define priorities. Um, which items should we work on first? You're going to have to determine the cost. You know, some, there might be cost on some of these items whether it's freeing up an operator's time for training, whether it's buying new equipment, items like that. And so you need to kind of put those cost versus benefit. And with the system that you can track, you can then estimate what the benefit's going to be pretty easily. So, and now you know the cost. Put those into priorities so that you can now formulate a plan of action and start correcting some of the items that are causing uh, reduced efficiency. Uh, you need a long-term strategy, too. It's just not put it in and you're done. It's a continuous process. Uh, you may need to set up a team that evaluates this uh, occasionally, just focusing on improving uh, downtime. It might be setting up routine meetings. But somehow you have to close that loop and uh, continue to work on the items that are affecting efficiency and continue to improve them. Uh, and with software, you have a benchmark. 
you know where you started from. You can see your improvement over time, and uh, that's extremely important. All right, the benefits of software, talk a little bit more about those. You know, you're automatically collecting production counts, automatically downtime events. We talked about that. You just can't stress it enough. It, it just makes it so much more accurate. You get more accurate data coming into the system. You can make better act, uh, decisions and actions to correct it. And it has historical storage. So if I want to compare last year to this year, or compare this operator last year to this operator this year, you can do so. Uh, it's paperless. You're not passing paper around. People can pull it up on their desks. They can pull it out on, up on the plant floor. Um, it also you know, really helps with collaboration, too, because if you had a schedule on paper and you send it out to your warehouse so they can get raw materials up, and that changes. How do you get the updates to them? Are you calling on the phone, on the radio to get updates to them, or do they just have it on their screen? Um, an alert comes up, or what, however you want to set it up. So it, it's real-time information, keeping everybody informed of what's happening. Um, it, it reduces labor. You know, the operators are either going over to paper and marking on paper, or they're just sele making selections on the screen, or maybe you have a system where the operator's not involved in, in hearing the data at all. Uh, but somebody later on is going to have to collect that information and enter it into a system. And that can take a long time, and it causes delays in getting that information back. Um, and frankly, it's just pretty easy to maintain. Um, if you don't have to constantly tweak your, your spreadsheet or, uh, you know, a manager wants to see the information in a little different format and you have to go back and update it, uh, those are all things that just make it a little difficult to maintain. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've seen systems where the paper is just unbelievable, the amounts of paper. And nobody puts it out on the desk and looks and compares between, you know, different months, different years, all that kind of stuff. Because it's frankly just too difficult. So the paper just kind of, you know, goes in a drawer or in the trash can and, and is not really being used. Software, if you put it in, um, I, I've heard of many, many stories where OE downtime implementations have, have actually failed. Um, and so there's some items here that I think are kind of important to make sure that that doesn't occur. Um, I, I've heard of cases where, you know, I'm not getting the data out of the system that I want. I can't see it how I want it. So I think making it very highly flexible on how you can pull that data out and present it. You know, can I create a screen for maintenance over here to give them exactly what they want? and supervisors give them a screen exactly as they want, management, everybody's getting the information that they want so that they can make good decisions and improve downtime. It, it just needs to be able to do that. So we don't want a canned solution where the software company said, well, this is, this is what you need and you need to change your production environment to fit our software. You want it the other way around. You want the software to be configured to fit your production environment. Um, you want more than just historical reporting. You want real-time information that people can act on now. You want to get relevant actionable data out of it as well. Um, you know, if you get data that's just interesting, that's great. That's not going to improve efficiencies. What you want is data that is actionable. You know, these are items that are happening now. We're seeing, you know, high number of occurrences on this machine. Let's go out to this machine and take a look at it and see why, if the system's not telling us why. That's something that you can go do today to make a change. Um, and, and in this day environment, too, ERP systems, are almost in every facility or organization. And you need to be able to integrate with those. So you reduce double entry or typos and things like that. If the ERP system has work orders on it, 
they can be utilized down at the execution layer on the plant floor and, and use those as well. Uh, at the same time, it needs to be able to integrate with the plant floor. If we can you know, communicate to the equipment on the floor and get the current downtime states or the current machine states and production information, that's a huge benefit. So historically, ERP systems are very high level, a little slower, you know, we'll process our transactions today instead of things right now. And they've been trying to push down and get into the execution layer, uh, MES layer there, and do track OEE and stuff. But their communication with the real floor is a barcode scanner or manual entry from an operator. The plant floor folks, PLC vendors and such, have been trying to push up into the MES layer and get to uh, provide OE downtime solutions. And they've been a little more and more successful at it than the RP people in some cases, but it's typically very high cost and doesn't integrate well with the RP systems and uh, just doesn't have the flexibility that, that we'd like to see. Um, and it really needs to be accessible from anywhere on your network. You know, if you can get information to people that they can do something about, that's going to, to turn into results. Might be mobile devices, so you're not tied to your desk. If you have a supervisor that's out on the floor a lot and he can he can see this information on a mobile device, that's that's better yet. All right, so ignition software, and I, I showed some demo screens there. That's that's our product, the OE downtime product. And that's built on the ignition software. And it's, it's really, you can think of it as a platform. It connects to databases extremely well, uh, talks to ERP systems, it's IT friendly, it, it's, uh, you don't have to install all these operating system service packs and all this chaotic stuff. And it, it's a common area that MES solutions can be put at and built on that allow these MES solutions to collaborate. It's not, especially today, in this day and age, you know, we have OE downtime. If we had a separate program doing that, and we had a separate program doing quality, and a separate program doing preventive maintenance, and a separate program doing traceability, we're going to have a lot of double entry or triple or <laughs> quad entry going on. And it's just not going to be a very nice system. And people may not use it because it's just not worth it. But Ignition's a platform where all these modules can go in and these modules collaborate together. So now when you're scheduling and now you know what run to run when, and you can track the OE for it, you also know what tests need to be done for your quality. Um, preventive maintenance can show up on the schedule as well. So you see the service alerts and so production knows what the the maintenance schedule is, the maintenance knows what the production schedule is. And traceability, you know when a product or a lot number ran through your plant and everywhere it was routed through your plant. And all the information is now available for it. You can see the recipes, you can see the quality, you can see the maintenance, you can see everything from that one user screen instead of going to separate programs and trying to connect the dots. So really, Ignition is a, a great platform for that to, to take place on. The uh, Ignition MES modules, we have the OE downtime uh, module that's available. It also includes scheduling, work orders, product codes, and such. Um, it's very cost competitive. Um, and Again, it's built on Ignition, and we're currently under development on the quality module. That integrates in with the scheduling that's already in place and work orders and things like that. It uh, comes with pre-built user screens and dashboards. Those you can modify because it's in Ignition. Ignition has a screen designer. You can go in there and change those and, and uh, you know, to fit your production environment instead of your production environment having to change to fit the software. So, and it really offers a, a real significant reduction in your 
implementation costs. All right. At this point, um, we will open it up to questions and answers. Tom, thanks. That was uh, that was really good. You know, the, I mentioned it earlier, but feel free to type in any questions. We have a number of them here, um, and also on this screen here, also you have contact. You can. You can tell we might be a little bit biased in the fact that, that what's been created with the Ignition platform and the web-based architecture and the flexibility that's going on there really uh, gives you an opportunity to do things you want to do with the system and have it do what Tom said, have it be the software fits your production, uh, the way you set up your production lines rather than you having to adjust how you're running your facility to fit a piece of software. Um, first off, will a copy of just simple question, a copy of the presentation be available? Yes, also this archive will be available on our site probably by this afternoon so that um, you can share it with colleagues, go over it again, look at any of the slides, do whatever you want. So Doug, you shouldn't have any uh, problem getting any use of this you want. And also, frankly, with uh, Jim Meisler, Vanessa Garcia, Myron Hurdling, and Shane Miller, if you want to set up any time to have a further presentation, Tom helps out with presentations all the time. If you have someone else in your organization Doug, that you want to uh, see this information shared with, we will do anything we can to work with you to help make this uh, workable for you. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. I'm going to go back to the failed uh, OE implementations for a second. Uh, so many companies have failed OE implementations. You mentioned it, Tom. How do you prevent that from happening and achieve success? Well, there's a number of steps you can do to help uh, in, in, uh, pre you know, in preventing that. <clears throat> um, Typically, it's a uh, system goes in that's a little bit awkward to use. It doesn't really involve the people who are going to be using the system up front in the design of it. So, you know, going to the supervisors, what information do you want to see? Uh, the operators taking a look at how are you going to have to interact with the system and, inter and minimize the number of things that you have to do in your already busy day. Uh, so those are some of the things, and, and uh, another really big one is getting accurate data. So to prevent those types of things, I, I kind of um, recommend putting in a pilot system on one or two lines and seeing how it interfaces with the operators. Because if you ask the operators up front, you know, what, what do you want on your, your screens or how do you want to interface with the system? Uh, they, they, you, you may not get an answer back. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> but as soon as you show them something, they will have an opinion suddenly. So, and that's very common. That's human nature. So it's an ongoing thing. If you put the pilot in and then the operators go, hey, can you change this? Or really, I don't want to have to do this. Or you can work out all those details. And maintenance goes, you know what would really be handy is to have this screen over here that gives us this information. You can build that during that pilot period. The other thing that does for you is up front, no one can guarantee you a return on investment with OE downtime. Really, there's so many other factors. How well you close the loop will affect uh, the, the reduction of downtime. So by putting in a pilot plan, you can say, oh, we started out with this OEE and we reduced or we increased it, you know, 10%, 15%, what have you. That means this amount of dollars in our production environment and our profitability. Now we can, you know, that makes sense to roll it out on these other lines in the plan. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. This is one back to the data. It says, uh, was the source of the data or input data coming from manual entry or directly from level two components? I think in terms of your examples and stuff you were, you were giving there. Yeah. Um, we have our demo set up here that it's showing kind of a hybrid system where we're, we're getting it directly from the plant floor. Um, and then the operator can then override. But really, we can accommodate anything. We can accommodate a totally automatic system. We have customers out there doing that. We can accommodate a manual system to where uh, you just simply have buttons on the screen that the operator presses or some, some form for them to, to do that. Um, 
So the important thing, I think, is, is if you can collect it automatically, I really recommend that because it becomes more accurate data uh, as far as your timing of your downtime. Um, if you can't record it automatically, then go to the manual system. And incidentally, in production facilities, you might have both. You might have where you need some manual and you need some automatic. And we support both of that. Great, Tom. Thanks. Um, this, this is a question overall in terms of cost. And I'm just going to make a comment and then let you respond to it. Um, but basic question, how much does an OE software implementation usually cost? How much does it cost to get started? Uh, We'll make some comments about ignition, but I just want to reference, I think manufacturing uh, automation comes up with an annual buyer's guide to MES software, and they have all sorts of different things. And I remember on, a, on an earlier presentation we did a slide, I don't have the exact number, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 150, 250,000 when you look at the software side. And the comment in the article was you can go three or four times that in terms of integration to actually make the thing work. So while I can't tell you, that was just, this article on MES solutions, what it takes to really make them work. Um, when you add on layers like that, you're sitting there saying, well, I'm going to spend 150, 250 on software, and it's going to take me three times that to get it implemented, and then you look at maintaining it, then you, you, can, you can actually push these things up to seven figures. Uh, and uh, frankly, what we're looking at with Ignition, we're saying we should be an order of magnitude cheaper for you to be able to do that and more because of the architecture we're built on, the flexibility, the unlimited screens, the unlimited you know clients and data and tags, it gives you the, the freedom to actually look at it with a different perspective on that uh, from a from a cost standpoint. But that that's just my overall comment on it. Tom, your your thoughts to the question? Yeah, I think exactly. I think um, some of that cost comes into play because of the customization that production facilities want in the A system, and so some systems. Re require that you're down to the Microsoft Visual Studio programming C-sharp type of stuff, which just results in, in more costs. Um, and it's slower, harder to maintain, and so on and so forth. Um, that's because they're built using the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio environment. So you're getting into the core of it. Uh, we, because this is, uh, our product's built on Ignition, it has a screen designer. It has database access and plant for communications and all that in place already and does it extremely well. So we're capitalizing on that. So it makes the implementation costs much, much cheaper, a lower skill level for, for modifying the screens compared to having to know a higher level programming language and stuff. So it, it helps bring the cost down. And um, you can get, we have the salespeople up on the screen there. You can get with the salesperson, and they can give you pricing. Also, our website has pricing uh, as well. Um, we disclose all the pricing up front. Um, generally, we have, or I should say, we have a starter package that's around $15,000 for the software license. Um, and it comes with a demo and all the screens and such that you can start with and then you can modify from there. Um, so cool. Thanks, Tom. I think I'd say is if, if you're actually paying less for the software up front, then when you look at percentage-based uh, maintenance and service contracts, you're actually maintaining the software at a lower overall cost from your operating costs as you go forward. So um, that, like Tom said, you can get more information from our uh, account executives but, and everything. We're very transparent. It's just from our own philosophy with inductive automation is we really want to serve you, uh, you whether you're the integrator to work with your customers or you whether end users, managers, line operators that are really trying to, uh, to get your facilities operating how you want them to be. Um, so ask us any questions and I think you'll find it's very straightforward with our answers. Another question here from, from Max Moore, going in a different direction. What type of hardware is needed to collect the data? What do I need to do to my machines to automatically collect data needed to track OEA? Okay, good question. Um, a lot of machines have controllers on them. Um, whether you can communicate to those controllers is, is another question. There's a, a standard in the industry, which is called OPC, that manages a lot of that communication. So. You know, companies like Kepware makes an OPC server that com communicates to many, many devices. Metricon's another one, but there's there's literally hundreds of them out there. 
some uh, companies have their own OPC server as well. Ignition talks to OPC servers as well as talk to some devices directly. So if you have an Allen Bradley device, we can talk to it. If you have uh, BNR PLC, well then they have an OPC server that we can talk to. In the event that you have, and we can collect the information from that, um, in the event that you have a hardwired machine, there is no controller. You have two options. You can either do it manually or you can put a small controller out there to pick up uh, just the information that we need and we communicate to that. Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, here's another question from uh, Jens uh, Heinemann. He says, is this an alternative to Oracle MLC or you realize the machine MLC interface? I'm not familiar with that product from Oracle myself. I know Oracle has not uh, been down on the plant floor level uh, collecting real-time information. Um, so we can, I can follow up on that and learn more about what that, that product is and, uh, okay. and get back to you on that. So, Jens, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that and get a little more information to give you a more thorough answer to your question. This is a, a long question. I'm just going to read. I don't know if it may be beyond what we can do in the couple minutes we have left here, but I'll read it anyway to you, Tom, and you can see if you can give an answer to uh, Rodney Martinez on this. During installation of production lines in water plants across the country, we integrated the fault files of machinery for automatic entry into the downtime tracking system. The problem was that the fault codes did not accurately represent the actual reason for the fault. Very often it was simple operator error. But in order to append the system with the actual reason for the fault operators spent for, for the fault operators spent a great deal of time entering information when they needed to be performing operational tasks. Um, so long question. Long question. Yeah, and, and that's uh, you know, operators are busy and how, what's their impact on them? We, um, we do a couple different things. Uh, one, we track both the automatic reason and then the operator reason. So if we take the example, um, if we detected an automatic reason that was operator press stop button, we collect that and show that, and then we, based on that downtime reason, operator selected uh, operator press stop button, we list sub-reasons that are underneath that uh, that the operator can select from. So it's a limited number thing. It's not a daunting task. So um, the other thing that kind of plays into this is I, I generally recommend starting out simple as far as collecting your downtime reasons. But if you have a problem area, a problem machine or a problem water pump station or, or so on, you know, then put more detail in, modify the system, and collect more accurate automatic reasons. I hope that answers your question there. If you need more follow-up on that, Ron, you can certainly just uh, send us an email and we'll, you know, Tom will do the best he can to respond to it further. Um, th this, uh, as we're coming to the end here, I, I, we're not getting to all the questions. I really appreciate your guys' uh, uh, participation, all of you folks on the line here. Just at least the final question because there were several about presentation and sharing with others. So OE seems to be a good investment. Um, I'm, I'm sold on it or I'm positive on it. How can I convince my boss and management that this will help the bottom line? Um, is there any, at least for a sort of final question, I guess, today, Tom, can you make a couple comments on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, focusing on the, the improvement and efficiency is, is one good thing. I mean, you have to ask the question, if we improved our efficiency by just 1%, what's that mean? in dollars and, and keeping up with orders and so on and so forth within your facility. Uh, the other thing is, is your boss is looking at it as a risk. He knows that there's going to be investment of time, uh, training, whatever else that's involved. You know, so that's where the pilot on one or two lines could be really good. So, you know, if you pilot on one or two lines, it's a little easier to sell to him, say, let's see if we get the good results. If we do, we can roll it out from there. If we don't, then, then no, we will just, uh, you know, not continue it. Great, thanks. 
Listen, I really want to say thank you to all of you for participating today. Um, you see on the screen, uh, if, you, if you want to, I uh, really encourage you to, uh, number one, go to our website and download the white paper and read it and share it with others in your organization that may be interested in this topic. Uh, number two, Jim, Vanessa, Myron, and Shane, many of you have relations with them already, but um, schedule a demo and actually uh, get on with them uh, and Tom and take a look at uh, how this may uh, apply to your organization so you can dig into a deeper dive and how uh, ignition and particularly this MES module of OE downtime could really be of use to you. And, and we can also talk about um, the roadmap for the future MES modules and the ones that are currently under development as well. Great. Anything else, Tom, you want to say before we end off? Yeah, I think that is it. I think uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Much appreciated. That's the end of our presentation. Have a great day.